Welcome back, everybody. I hope you had a light lunch because we still have a ton of content to go through and we want, don't want you to fall asleep during these talks. The title of this talk, as Chris mentioned, is Moving Away from Null and Exceptions. Both are mainstays of error handling in programming, and we want to share why we think there are better alternatives to them. I'm Mario, and I'm here together with Andre, and we have here some sort of standing desk contraption going on. I hope it will hold throughout the talk. So yeah, let's hope for the best there. And what to expect? Apart from, you know, null and exceptions, we are going to be presenting some ideas from functional programming that have inspired us. But it's not really a talk about functional programming. We are not experts here, so this is to the limit of our knowledge, of course. We're going to start with the takeaways so that you know what we actually want you to take out of this talk from the very beginning and can decide if you actually find it, if you agree or not. So takeaway number one, let's stop using null. Our claim is that there is no reason to use naked null, null values, for some definition of that, in a modern programming program language anymore. And our second takeaway is let's stop abusing exceptions. We find code that throws an exception every single time something unexpected happens hard to understand and more difficult to maintain. So before we get started with actual content, some, some context, where is this? Where did, where did we develop these ideas? Typical big German corporation project has many APIs, many clients, legacy systems. And in the end, most backends are basically consumers and producers of JSON. And so we find, or we have found out that having nimble and lightweight applications make that experience a lot easier. Which brings me to this uh, slide. It's really nice that if you listen to the tech radar discussion, we got both of this already, and we're going to show you a bunch of code examples. And they're going to be in uh, Kotlin, and we're going to be also showing a bit of error, a functional uh, programming library that brings these concepts to Kotlin. So why Kotlin? Well, there are many reasons. We really like how concise Kotlin is, yet how accessible it remains to be adopted. For the purposes of this talk, there are three features that are particularly relevant. The first one is nullable types. The second one is sealed classes. And the third one is the lack of check exceptions. All three are going to make an appearance throughout this talk. You will see what we mean and what we like it. And so I guess that's enough for an introduction. So let's start talking about null now. Hello, everyone. I'm Andre. Um, so, null, um, the infamous null reference, or uh, the billion dollar mistake like the uh, Tony Hoare presents it. Now, let's be honest. When did you have a null pointer exception in production? Um, I don't know about you, but every time I get one, it, I kind of feel like this, like, ah, oh, I should have known better. So, why does this happen? I mean, in reality, Things are more complicated than they um, that they than we initially think about them, and things which can be missing will be missing at some point. And let's take this code for example, where you basically get a list of uh, scopes and for a user, and we want to check if the user is um, an admin or not. And then, because of what I said earlier, we just have to check for everything. Is it null? Okay. Is it null? Okay. Is it null? Okay. And it looks quite bloated, right? So basically what we want to achieve is to model absence, but instead we end up with a very ad hoc way of handling null pointer exceptions, basically. And as uh, we saw in the last example, our code ends up quite bloated and polluted. So not only that, but um, although we might use a statically typed language like Java, it doesn't help us very much because um, we are basically sidestepping this type system. We are saying string, but we are returning null. And um, besides polluting our code and not being explicit enough, let's be honest. We don't, we don't end up checking and uh, um, having this uh, if checks natural way. Nah, we learn the hard way when we get the no pointer exception in production. So we end up with feedback at runtime instead of compile time. 
And Mario mentioned already nullable types. So um, this is one of the features we really like in Kotlin. And um, this way, we are really explicit about modeling absence. And let's take a quick example here. Um, notice the question mark at the return type string. Well, basically, we are saying that uh, when you're calling the function, the result might be missing. That signals to the compiler that this function may return a string or a null. So in comparison to Java, for example, where we just have string, we, there's no way to guarantee. Here we are, we are telling the user and, we are, and the compiler is forcing them to treat basically this possibility. And we are being explicit also when you read it. Very nice. And uh, we are getting compile time feedback. Very important. Now, how do we use this? Well, Kotlin has some other baked in um, features for goodies for us to use. Not, notice the question mark before the dot let. Same way like uh, for the string question mark. It basically passes the result of the extract token to the lambda in the curly braces only if the result is present. If there's no result, nothing happens. Just like uh, when you have map in, um, uh, over a function, over um, a list. So hence the extract token operation, if the extract token operation returns null, the function won't be executed, we're safe. But you might ask what about uh, more complex uh, flows? Let's look at um, coming back to our context we have a header and then we want to move to the next step to extract the token, then to verify the token and to get the security check. Well, as I said before, everything can be null. We end up with something like this. Well, not really ideal, right? It can get out the fan, it can blow up. So coming back, we want key takeaway, we want to model uh, explicitly the absence of value. And I would like to handle, hand it over to Mario to tell us what are our options. All right, before we move forward on to option, let's spend two minutes talking about data types. Let's have a definition here. A data type is an abstraction that encapsulates one reusable coding pattern. This concept is present both in, uh, in object-oriented programming and in functional programming. In functional programming, the concept tends to be a bit more formalized, it's a bit closer to math, and we're going to try to get to there. Usually when I talk about these data types, I find it's really useful to use the containers as a name, you know, or like a box. Think of you have, I mean, having a box where you're putting your data and you're storing it. That is not just what we want to do, right? We are don't only want to hold data. We also want to interact with it. So we have a clear interface to manipulate it. And we also have clear semantics in the, that define how how does it behave? How does the data that we have in there react to this operation that we have? This is a bit abstract and I'll come back to this. I'll try to be a bit more specific so that it becomes a bit clear. There are many different data types. There are many more than we have time to present here. We're going to be focusing on two that match very well with the topics that we are talking about. And they, they are option and either. I realize this is kind of a quick introduction. So if you want to read a bit more, there's a link here that you can follow to get more context. This was a bit high level. So let's get a bit more practical. Let's start talking about option. Option actually is a pretty common data type. Java has, have it, has had it for a very long time. And other languages have it as well. So it's nothing new. And we are modeling absence of value, as Andre said. Much, I mean, with option, we're much doing the same as with a nullable type. Here's a diagram to represent option. We say that an option is a disjoint union, a sum type in functional programming. That means that our container has, can have one of two possible values. It can be something with a generic type, or it can be nothing, but not the same at the same time. You have to pick. So that's what we represent. How do we implement it? Let's have a look. This is a very simple implementation that we have done in Kotlin. So you see, it's a, we are using a sealed class there, and this sealed class has two different implementations, a sum or none. The fact that we are using a sealed class means that we can actually use pattern matching, and we are going to see in a second what, how does how does that look like. 
So we have this uh, option. And now the question is like, how do we use it? So coming back to the example that we showed before, we are switching this to use an option. We're using this maybe helper method from Arrow actually, that kind of wraps this nullable type and gives back an option. So our function is essentially the same thing, it's just returning a different, a different thing. And that is how we, coming back to, you know, I'll keep saying this container, uh, using this container analogy, this is how we put these things in the container, but how do we extract them? So whenever we have these containers, we need to pick into it and decide what to do based on its content. That's usually called unwrapping the value. And we are doing that, just that here. So we are saying, all right, based on the value, on, you know, what is actually in that container, we're making a decision. If it's none, if it's nothing, we're just going to return an error. If there is something, we are going to return the value that we had. And we are using this pat pattern matching here. This is a Kotlin feature. I mean, it's shared by many languages nowadays. And I find it really easy to read. Like just for that, I like it. You know, I, I like the syntax, but another benefit is that it's exhaustive, which means that we're ensuring that every possibility is being handled. In our case, we only have like two, two, you know, different values, two branches, if you will. But it could be that we will be using a data type that has many different branches, and we can ensure through the compiler that every of them are being handled by the client, so that we make sure that we actually, you know, as a client, are handling every possibility, and they are not leaving, you know, this in an uh, implicit state, so to say. And that's something that we can do thanks to the pattern matching. And I find it really helpful because it moves the feedback from the runtime to the compile time. We already mentioned that as well, right? But thus far, what I'm saying is, you know, we have this container, I'm putting things in, I'm taking things out. This is not really different from an allo type. On its own, option might not be something that's worth adopting given that Kotlin already gives you some native support but it's kind of a gateway drug. From here, you can get started, and then you can move on to all using all the data types, combining them, and operating on them, which is what I mentioned in the beginning. Container is not just holding data. It has semantics, it has an interface. So let's have a look at that interface. Every data type has an interface, and it has semantics. I'm not going to talk about this just yet. I'm going to come back to this or a similar slide when I talk about either. But before we get there, I'm really going to uh, tell, you, tell you about exceptions. So um, we started with error handling uh, alternative ways. One of the major things are exceptions. And if we think about every path or code can be subject to failure, and our app has to either cope with it or fail itself. And in many programming languages like Java, this is being handled by throwing exceptions. So, quick question, again, be honest. Um, when was the last time you got a 500 in production? So, or did you get one lately? And um, in case you were having a web app. As I said before, this pattern is pretty common. And um, once you do get it, you end up with something like this. Yeah, sure, a lot of things gets packed in, it's a bit ugly, but we learn to read these stack traces and hopefully we get the information about the cause and location of our problem, um, and then we can go ahead and fix it. So you might ask yourself, what's the problem with this, right? We can type check, type check on them, unlike with nulls, and uh, we can go as uh, fine granular as uh, we need by throwing multiple types of um, checked exceptions, right? Well, as I will try to convince you in the next slides, um, this can easily lead to, lead to bad decisions. Now, why is that? And let's think about it, like coming back a bit. A uh, large majority of catastrophic uh, failures are a result of incorrect handling of non-fatal errors. Basically, we are um, failing to, like we are sending them improperly throughout and we are signaling them to the upper layers um, in a not so consistent way. So remember our context, basically we, although we have all the type check we need in a language like Java, we still get enough 500s. Now, why, right? First of all, they are easy to ignore or miss. This happens because we are either um, 
destroying them or even worse um, ignoring them in an empty catch although we are clearly advised not to do that by the author of the effective java book and um, we are not even obliged to handle uh, runtime exceptions uh, not to mention that in our projects we are using a lot of libraries and frameworks and there's no real conven conventions and um, Wrapping check rapid, wrapping check exceptions in uh, runtime exceptions is quite uh, yeah it, it, it happens quite often, hence um, you will have an exception from here flowing up, creating some unpredictable flow and yeah, another problem is that exceptions can often end up uh, being used as flow control, and again we are being advised by the effective Java book author that. We should not do that because a well-designed API must not force its clients to use exceptions for ordinary flow control, like wrong password or user not found. And then if we really take the step backwards and look at the big picture, it breaks encapsulation. I mean, taking this example, right? Happy path, right? We get the request in the controller, we pass it to our service layer, it goes to the API client, for example, or to our database. Everything is fine. We have all the rights. The data is there. We return it. It's not null. It's beautiful. We return it to the controller. We're happy. But I think half of the time, more or less, this thing doesn't happen, right? Um, we have an error. Either the API client or the, the user is not found, and it just jumps. So we have basically a different path for the problematic case. Basically, we are not fully understanding our domain, I think, right? It's, 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 it's a clear, but weird, modern code to statement. And, um, sorry. And if we um, look, for example, at this interface, I mentioned before that we are using uh, different libraries for different stuff. Well, this one is supposed to tell us if a JVT token is valid. And you look at it and you say, oh, good, I can just call it and it will tell me yes or no. But maybe not in Kotlin. Uh, Mario mentioned that uh, we don't have uh, exceptions, um, checked exceptions, another reason why uh, we like it. Um, we have, often end up clicking through it up to a point like this, and then we read throws, 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 throws. Oh, okay, okay, so now we know. <laughs> so we're not being explicit, again, the same problem. And a typical way of handling this in the same scenario, you have a, a filter which catches uh, our exceptions, and in there you can uh, reply accordingly and uh, yeah to be honest this yeah feels a bit awkward now coming back I think we're missing something um, what is an exception right I mean it's the failure or the inability of the system to to um, do the job we wanted it to do basically it went wrong right our cluster going down is an exception what we as programmers mostly throw are not really exceptional cases. Think about it. Failing to open a file, serialization errors, user not found, wrong password. I think these are all uh, cases which are part of our domain. And as the context grows larger and larger, I mean, it's already in, it's hard enough to handle, handle, handle error cases on a smaller scale, but you get more bigger context with uh, cross domains and so on, it becomes too hard. And um, because we are not even compelled to test for them, they're easy to miss untested and hence error prone. And then just like we were um, doing earlier with nulls, here we're trying to model explicitly that an operation may fail in a way or another. So let's see how we can better do that. I'll hand it back to Mario. All right, so. We talked about option as an alternative to nulls first, and then Andre talked about why we really dislike exceptions. And now I'm going to talk about the either data type as an alternative to throwing exceptions. So you, know, you will see like, I mean, when we are talking about these data types, it's really kind of symmetrical in a way. So many of the things that I've said about option are going to apply to either as well. In this case, what is an either? either models the result of a computation. A computation can either succeed or fail, and that's what we want to build with this. So let's have a look at this diagram. Does it look familiar? It is similar to what I showed before about option, 
Again, we have a disjoint union of two possible values. By convention, we call these two possible values left and right. This convention comes from Haskell, if I'm correct. The left value is used for the error case when the computation went wrong. The right value is used for the success case when, you know, when actually what we did worked out. You might have seen and used this data type already, and sometimes it's called a result. In that case, in a result, you could be calling the left side something like failure or error, and the right side something like okay or success. Kotlin is getting a native result type, and something like Rust has it as well. So it is coming to our, your friendly neighborhood language. Implementation. Well, again, we're using a sealed class, same deal as with option. This time we have a second type parameter because we are also holding data in the case of, a, of an error, so to say. And we come again to the question, how do we use this? How we actually introduce this in our code? For that, we're looking back at, looking back at the interface that Andre showed before. This verifier, is now being explicit that it can actually fail, that it's performing a computation that might fail, and we are representing that by its return type, with, which is now an either type, which means if everything goes as we expect, we'll have a token in the end. And if, if not, we'll have an exception. I just said exception, but there's an important point here to make. We use exceptions here but we use them as a domain modeling tool. We have a space, like a domain space contains a lot of error conditions and we want to model them. We want to make that domain richer and we are using exceptions for that. That's just fine. What we are not doing is throwing them all over the place. We're not sidestepping our flow by you know, jumping to a different parallel flow. That's what we are not going to do. And it will actually stay in this one flow, so to say. Usually you always have code you know that for some reason or another, it's actually throwing you know, external libraries, parts of your program that you didn't migrate. So a typical pattern that we have adopted is wrapping that code to make sure that starting from that point, you are using either throughout. So in this case, we just you know, have a normal try catch and the value whenever things go you know, the way we, we want it, we are building a right value out of it. And if we actually have an exception, we'll have a left value. Technically speaking, this is a bit, you know, pushing the boundaries of functional programming because we are using side effects, but I think it's for our purposes, it works well enough. So again, containers, you know, the analogy, I'm putting things in my container and I need to extract them as well. I'm not showing a slide for that because I don't need to. This works the exact, exact same way as, I, as with option we are using pattern matching to extract it based on the different branches, and we get the same. As I said, these data types are very symmetrical, so what you learn once can be reapplied over and over. However, this is where I finished with option. I said that you know, just having the values there, just having like that and getting it back, doesn't really bring us that far. So now I want to, sp now I want to talk about, well, how you evolve the value inside a container as for computations happen. So let's go back to the interface. Now with for either, but essentially the same. We have a main interface for all our data types and the two typical operations or the most important ones, if you want, are map and flat map. You probably have already seen map and flat map. I mean, if you are working with collections, the list will have them. And incidentally, a list is a data type as well. So what do we do with a map? With a map, we take the value that is inside the container and we apply a function to it, which might convert it to a different value. Whatever is contained there might mute evolve. And then we have flat map. Flat map is specialization of that. It covers this particular case, use case. Imagine you are, you know, you have this either and you want to apply a function, but it's so ha it just so happens that this this function that you're applying might fail as well. And so we are being consistent now and we are actually modeling that with an either type, which would mean if we were using map that we would get an either of an either. And if there's a third step, we could get an either of an either of an either 
and so on and so forth, and then you would get a chain of nested uh, data types that would actually be really hard to use. So that's what the, the case that flat map covers, a way to flatten your hierarchy and keep your, you know, your computation easy to manipulate and to understand. So you end up, when working this way, you end up chaining operations. You know, you have it here, the unsafe verify file I was wrapping before, now I'm converting it to a different kind of token because that fits my domain logic better. This is a good time to talk about the semantics of either, which I have mentioned once or twice. We, see, we say that either is, uh, is right bias, which means that map and flat map only get applied for right values, which actually means that it's short circuits. If you are kind of changing your computations one after another, and in the middle of some, uh, in the middle, one of your computation actually fails and you get a left error value, the rest of the operations won't get applied anymore. That means that you can be sure that your functions are always running on safe or on correct values, and that you're not trying to apply some, I mean, to a, you know, a value that is broken in some, in some way. However, this previous example was a bit too simplistic. Usually your logic is not modeled through one single function, right? Usually you have multiple steps and your logic is, you know, more involved in that. So let's have a look at this flow again. We share it before, and it's based around authenticating requests. We have a bunch of uh, steps. Each of those can fail. How do we represent this in code? We don't want to unwrap and wrap it every time. We want instead to use a sequence of chain computations, which can look like this. So we define it as a sequence of map and flat map. So what's, what we say is like we apply these functions to our data type, and when we are done, we can unwrap the value that we got and decide, decide based on it what to do. We don't unwrap until we are finished, I mean in the middle. So we kind of built a pipeline here where our data flows through it, and we can be completely and 100% sure that we are not applying functions to a broken value. And Incidentally, I mean, coming back to the code that was full of if this is not null, if this is not null, for me, it represents much better what I'm trying to accomplish instead of like kind of breaking you out of the flow. This previous example might have triggered reactions. I mean, for me at least, it looks like a bunch of nested promises in JavaScript. And we all know that not everybody is a fan of that syntax. Some like it, some don't. So I want to finish what I want to say about either by talking about an alternate flat syntax for a second. To keep the JavaScript analogy going, it can be seen as something similar to a single weight, where you kind of re you see it in a different way, but essentially you are doing the exact same thing. It's sometimes called the do notation, and it's something that is provided by Arrow, this library that came up in the radar and that we have come to like quite a bit. So it would look like this. You know, I'm not going to get into how this works in detail. Maybe we can leave that for the, for the Slack channel because it's a bit involved. But the message here is that we can actually use a flat syntax if we are used to that, if it feels more natural to use, we can use it this way. And the very important thing is that this is actually always using either, either data types in inter, for intermediate steps which means that all these functions that we are calling are never up being applied to a broken value. Again, this thing about this pipeline, about not unwrapping and wrapping, this allows us to do this. And this blog is all there is to it about either. You can get started just with this. If you actually want to read a bit more about the whole thing, I actually wrote a pretty long article about it. So have a look if you didn't think this is enough either for you for today. But for now, let's stop talking about either, and we are going to finish, Andrea is going to finish with a summary of all we talk about. So let's come back to the key takeaways which were mentioned in the beginning. Um, null and exceptions are ways of handling errors. We say that they can lead to flaky and hard to understand code and uh, other problems and uh, yeah. Let's stop using nulls. By all means, we want to model absence actually there. There are better ways of doing that. You don't need special effects in languages and so on. 
um, you can take the, the, the idea behind it and try to make it. I think there have been already patterns even in, in Java by now. And um, let's stop abusing exceptions. Again, we're trying to model here the problem, the, the fact that um, executing one part of the code might lead into problems. Now, those problems are not exceptions. They are part of your domain. Consider them part of your domain. Think about it, model them appropriately. Again, exceptional cases can be that your database catches fire. And um, yeah, um, I would like to thank you all for uh, staying with us. And uh, if there's any questions, uh, yeah, we will be answering now. And we'll also be in the Slack channel afterwards. Cool. Thank you both very much. Um, you can definitely trust they will be in the Slack channel because Andre has actually already been answering questions about the talk before the talk was finished, which I thought was an extra level of achievement on a remote uh, conference. So thanks for that, Andre. But we do have some questions in, um, uh, in Zoom as well. Um, so the first one is, would this kind of error handling be possible in Java, for example, using Aspect J? I mean, option is in Java, right? So you can already switch to, I mean, actually, I, I think some, some clients of us actually really want to use options instead of nows when, when uh, well, when modeling absence of value. And you can build an either type as well. I think you will hit what uh, Java allows you, like this pattern matching makes it a lot more elegant to use. So it will be a bit more uh, cumbersome, but it is definitely possible, would be my answer. Cool. I think the problem is the lack of being exhaustive about it. That's that's the only thing you are missing. But you can still be uh, very um, like expressive about it, about your intentions. So that's very important, and you should still do it nonetheless. Cool, great. I've got another question about applying the the concepts in different languages. This is from Melvin. I absolutely love option and either etc. So you know, I guess a fan. Um, I'm implementing this in my most uh, used language currently, C sharp but I find it doesn't play very nice or at least not easily with asynchronous code. Do you have any advice on how to deal with this? Maybe not C sharp specifically, but generally how to deal with these kind of error modeling and async. I don't know. My thought of, so the last, last, last thing I actually ended up playing with uh, was uh, the async part in the latest Spring Boot uh, with Kotlin. And uh, there is some integration with, uh, uh, with the result, uh, but I think we can again like ask ourselves what we want to model and uh, if we're being explicit about the result being a problem or being a, an actual result value, you can signal that out and uh, um, think of the, the concept, think of like being explicit about what you want to do rather than um, using either. Yes, you will lose some, but I'm pretty sure that you gain some other parts through the async process. So. I, I think I'm being a bit too abstract. I'm sorry about that. I haven't gotten much in the in the Spring Boot part of the other, so we were failing due to some other reasons. So we didn't proceed, at least not at that time. If you want to check Arrow, Arrow actually has a specific data type for uh, I don't know exact name. I don't know if it's future or async or it is model. I mean, you can model this as a data type itself, like an asynchronous computation, and in the end, you more or less apply it the same way. So I think that would be a good starting point to get inspired. Okay, cool. Thanks for that. And I'm sure if, if they want any more specific details, they can they can ping you on Slack. Cool. Uh, have some more questions. Um, this one's about unit testing. How does using options and either change the tests that you write? That's a very good one. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have much time to focus on the tests, and we just mentioned them here and there. Um, I think the more clear example is uh, um, the exceptions, right? How cumbersome and how weird checking for an exception inside the test, uh, like make the code look like, the test code look like. Not to mention that we're not even um, like uh, really com like compelled to do so. So that's the, the, the weird part, which I, I feel. Um, Whereas when you have a result, you look at it, you know it can be 42 or, or 13, right? You will test for that. But the exception, if it's not explicit, you, you won't. With an either, you have it there. It's a constant reminder. Oh, maybe I should test for that part. Not to mention that if you're doing DDDs, yeah, it's more direct. We, we do have uh, some code samples. Maybe we can share them in the Slack channel. 
uh, using Strict, another library for Kotlin, we have like built some helper tools to actually, you know, reflect these intents that are super readable. So maybe that's easier to see in code. We have to take it out because lack of time, but definitely can can share it. Cool. Well, I really like that point. So you're saying not, you know, not it might change a bit how you write the tests, but it also changes how easy it is to see what tests that you need to write because you've you've modeled things explicitly. Makes sense. Uh, we've got uh, one more question in the chat right now. Uh, we've got a bit more time to we can answer it. Um, this so sound, all sounds great, and I cannot wait to give it a try. Still, are there any downsides or strings attached when doing this? You have to. I mean, uh, you have to get used to it. Like it's a, you know, like you are so used to. All right, you call a function and you have the value. And now sometimes this data type is staying in between your data and yourself, right? So it's like, fine, I, I just want to extract it. Like, really, let me get it. And then you have to do this pattern matching or you have to map it or flat map it. So I think the familiarity is something that you have to get used to. And you have to be like disciplined in, in, in that because maybe you were not handling these conditions before. And this is like a reflection, the way that you were doing something that might be unsafe. So I think that is for me the, the like the biggest and combining different data types we didn't get into that but maybe you are saying all right let me do dependence injection as a data type like using a reader let me do input and output with io like you know if you want to go full side effects free full haskell if you combine three of them uh kotlin reaches the limit of what you can do today they are working on it but this can i mean yeah you can see there where at some point uh, Gets, it gets tough. So I, I would say that for me would be, uh, yeah, of a solution. Yeah, I, I agree with the, the, the mentality shift in the, the way we are thinking about it. And um, I think we've been mentioning this before that it's rather um, a path you're taking. So you might start with, with an option and then get used to it. Uh, one mistake which I personally did was to use directly something very cool and then we ended up with something awkward you still do something which is convoluted and hard to understand and that's not the purpose. I think you should evolve as a team and you should bring the whole team. And uh, what's cool about Arrow, for example, is that they don't have one library, they have a bunch of libraries and you can add them as you need. And that's really cool because you, you, you kind of limit the scope of what you can use and you only add the next one after, let's say you've finished this level and you leveled up <laughs> in knowledge and understanding of these patterns and yeah. Cool, makes sense. Um, I'm gonna inject one question I personally have because I really like to talk and there's something I'm curious about and we're, we're out of audience supplied questions. But uh, you talked about you know, going on this journey and you talked a lot about the benefits of making your domain modeling clear to the compiler. If you're someone who is working in a programming language that doesn't have a type system, if you're in Python or Clojure or Ruby, would you still consider using options and either's or is it more something that gives you the most benefit in typed languages? I would say there is value to that. I mean, I actually was, uh, I have it a half big project of writing an either data type for TypeScript. I'm kind of trying to use like the TypeScript type system to model that in a way that is not too cumbersome to use. And I think that is like when you have a front end and a back end and you're saying, I'm making a network request, that thing might fail. And we kind of ignore that often, but it's, it's definitely something that can fail. And I think having it modeled this, this way more explicitly can make your code more like, you know, explicit what it's trying to do. So I think, I mean, like I said, it's a pending thing I want to, I want to try that so that I was, it's a plan to do it in Ruby to see how it looks like. And I think you lose a bit of the safety. Like you cannot really say the compiler is telling me this, this, and this, but still, I think you can, definitely there's value to be had there. Well, to add to that, yes, to especially the being expressive about your return type and um, minor um, uh, source of uh, like inspiration uh, on Egghead, uh, there's one whole thing on explaining very basic functional programming with a box analogy. It's by uh, dubbed Professor Frisbee, and that's, a, that's done in plain old JavaScript. And um, it's really cool to have a look, and there are very short videos. Have a look, and you might get an idea. I can share it later on, on, uh, on the slide. Yeah, that'd be really useful to share that link. I guess 
uh, even if you think about Python, one of the Pythonic values is explicit is better than implicit. So you would say, if you follow that, then that would lead you to say, if I have an error condition, I should be explicit about the error condition can happen um, rather than implicit about it. Cool. Is there any other um, last words of wisdom that you'd like to to leave us with to inspire us to uh, to head off on our optional and either futures? No. I mean, we have the dinosaur there recommending to stop using nuts. I hope okay. you <laughs> but, uh, so, awesome. yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you both very much for the talk and the uh, the preparation. And um, I'm sure it's pretty directly applicable to all of our programming lives. <laughs>